out of Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. I'll have you just follow along. And it says this, for a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. We are starting a new series called Revered. I thought about this and and as I was, I think I was probably getting ready for my day. The Lord said, Paul Revered. I'm like, are you kidding me? That has nothing biblical to it. And he goes, but Paul Revered. And as we are about ready to enter into our Advent series this morning, the Advent series has, or season has started, and Advent really does mean to proclaim the coming. To proclaim the coming. And I thought about that and I was like, wow, what better way than to proclaim the coming from a guy who wrote a third of the New Testament proclaiming the coming of the King at the end times. What better way to proclaim the birth of Christ this Christmas season and say he's coming in hope through Paul, who revered the King of Kings. Right? And so as I was thinking about that, God gave that to me because I'm not smart enough to come up with that. I want to dig into Scripture because I believe Scripture is a great reminder of our theme today of hope. We don't find our hope in Scripture. We find that the hope of hope in Scripture. Hope is found in Jesus. Hope is found in Jesus. And Scripture teaches us that, that when we want to hope, we have to look at the Scriptures to find where that hope is and give it up to the hope. The hope is Jesus. The Scriptures are good. They are not bad. They are great. They are phenomenal. You read it, you learn from it, and you worship the man who created it. The man who who told these guys what to write. The man who told Paul what to write for a third of the New Testament. Inspiring him on what to write. Hope is the confident expectation of what God has promised and its strength is in his faithfulness. I'm going to repeat that again. Hope is the confident expectation of what God has promised. And its strength is in His faithfulness. We're going to light these lanterns here in a second. And I think what's cool about these lanterns and this Paul Revere series is, one, it kind of fits the Illinois culture. You know, you think back Illinois 120 years ago. And you think, well, this is how they lit their house, right? This is how they they walked in the dark, right? Two weeks ago, we talked about running in the darkness. 120 years ago, if you wanted to run in the dark, you probably would have grabbed something that looked a lot like this. And so as we light this this candle, so to speak, this, this idea here, when Paul Revere went for a ride in the dark to announce the British are coming, or like some of us remember, the Redcoats are coming. He probably had something similar to this, probably not this. It might have been a torch, I don't know. Can I, yeah, I can do this. Maybe. Yeah, lit, yay. Amen, right? Yay. It's a a real lantern, it's not LED. I probably should have gotten LED. But, That light represents the hope we're going to talk about here. That light represents hope starting today. That light represents the confident expectation of what God has promised and its strength in His faithfulness. Now, revere means to show devoted, differential honor to. or regard as worthy of great honor. And so it's only fitting that today we would start our Advent series of revered or revere with hope. 
Because if we are going to revere, then we have to hope. We have to hope in Christ. We have to give or regard Christ as worthy of great honor. We have to have a hope in him to revere him, to regard him as worthy of great honor. We have to. He's not just this big guy that sits there and doesn't give us hope. He's not just this big guy that I want to revere because he's just a big guy. He's not this big guy that I just want to revere because he gives me all the blessings I could ever desire. The biggest blessing of all is hope. Right? And so as Paul Revere rode to announce the Redcoats are coming, we are going to go through some of Paul's teaching to announce Jesus is coming. He wants to get you. I revere him so much that I have a hope in him. No, I have a hope in him so much that I want to revere him and announce that Jesus is coming and he's coming for the ones we love. And that's something to be happy about. I love that. Jesus loves you so much. He's going to get you. There's not a warrant out for your arrest. He's not the cops. He's not going to come and arrest you. He's coming to set you free. See. There's this hope, this expectation, not of just eternal life, but of eternal worship. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. If you don't like repeating yourself, maybe you should choose a different faith because when I get to heaven, I'm joining the angels singing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Jesus has come. He's come to set me free. He's made me free indeed. Like, this is real. And because of that, I have a hope that I will one day not just make it to heaven, not just walk on gold streets. God, I could care less about that. I care more about just going, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I just want to repeat myself. I just want to repeat myself because there's nothing else I can ever come up with other than what's written in Scripture to worship Him like the angels do. Man, how cool would that be? That's my hope. My hope is not to build a house in heaven. My hope is to give the treasures I've collected for heaven back to Jesus and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I can't stand it. And because we are teaching on hope today and we're revering God today and throughout the rest of December, And we're going to ride out into our mission fields. And we're going to proclaim the word of God. We've got to dig in to the word of God. We're going to proclaim Jesus' salvation. We've got to dig in. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, says this. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said... I believed in God, so I spoke. We know that God, who raised the Lord Jesus, will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. I want to look at something real quick. Faith brings hope. Faith brings hope. Hope brings reverence. Faith brings hope. Hope brings reverence. You know the other three topics of the Advent series bring reverence too? There's your theme. <laughs> reverence. We got a joy for reverence. We got a love for reverence. We got to have peace for reverence. When we have all four of those things, we can revere for a very long time. And we can announce the coming of Christ. And we can announce that he wants to break into your heart. He wants to wreck what you once knew and make his kingdom found in your life. What? Christmas isn't about my gifts. Church isn't about my gifts. This isn't really about me today. You know, I have a, I have a, I'm going to mess up my notes because at the very end of my message, I say this. Hopelessness is selfish and hopefulness is about someone other than self. And let me repeat that because I don't think some of you got that. Hopelessness is selfish. And hopefulness 
is about someone other than yourself. When you're hopeful, you're hopeful because of you? No, because of God. I'm hopeful because of Jesus. I'm hopeful because I see more potential in this person than they see in themselves. Oh, snap. That sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Hey, let me know if anything catches on fire behind me, okay? I smell the flame. That's the only reason. But, sorry, I, I totally lost you there, huh? But faith brings hope. My faith is not selfish. I can't let my faith become selfish. I know faith brings hope, but hope feeds faith. Does that make sense? Like, it first comes faith. You got to have faith. Then, all of a sudden, you have hope, which then, in turn, feeds faith. That's cool. That's like growing up and growing old. You have your children, right? Child is hope here. You feed hope. You give hope everything it needs. And then when you get old and tired, hope feeds faith. I just, that just came to me. That's not in my notes. Right? But faith, when you get tired, of serving the God of gods, the King of kings, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the everlasting peace, the, the joy of our life. Hope, if you have hope, it'll feed your faith. And you won't get too tired to go on tomorrow for someone else other than yourself. Just as people in the Old Testament, sorry, I'm going to finish what I said. We, we have to have faith that Jesus will do what he says he will do. So we can have more hope, right? Just as the people of the Old Testament should have had faith in the prophets who told them. What did we read to start? Isaiah! Do you guys get it? Jesus is coming. He's going to be born. He's going to reign supreme forever. You Jewish people, he's going to come. You're not even going to see it. He's coming. He, he is the. He is. He is fair. He is just. He'll sit on the throne of David. He's passion. He's passionate. Like this guy's gonna come. Don't you see it? Don't you see it, Jewish people? The Jews should have remembered. Like they should have looked at Isaiah and gone, "Yeah." Instead, they killed him. That's crazy to me. We have to have that faith that brings hope so that we can feed our faith again. I believe God also, God, uh, I believe in God, so I spoke. That's scripture. We should have that same kind of reality, that same even parallel that says, I believe Jesus, so I will go when he told me to go. I will go where he told me to go. I will go when he told me to go. I will go at all times, when he calls me to go. You guys see that? But Ben, I'm tired this week. I get that. Driving 10 hours straight will make you tired. Driving another four hours the next day is still, I mean, you're still recovering from 10 hours. I'm 34 now. I'm still a spring chicken to some of you. But sometimes 30 minutes gets you tired, right? If you drive to Chicago and you drive in Chicago, you don't want to drive back because you're so tired from white knuckle in it, right? I drove on Thanksgiving week. It wasn't white knuckle. Bola actually drove out because she doesn't let me drive because she gets sick. But on my way back, I drove. And 10 hours is 10 hours, especially when you had a week of fun. You know, you're tired when you start, you're tired when you end, and you're tired the next day. The following day, I took a day off. I probably shouldn't have. Jesus didn't call me to take a day off. Ben, why are you taking a day off? I've given you things to do. Do them. Right? He also gave me a seventh day. That's today, right? <laughs> I like that. At least one person cheered for a day off. Yay! <laughs> you know? I have hope! There's a slide at the end of the week. Sunday! Day off. That's what Chick-fil-A employees say. 
When we are raised up, we will see our benefit. When God raises us up, you will see your benefit. Okay? But guess what? The scripture's not done at that. It's not all about your benefit. It's not about your benefit. Then we will see a great thanksgiving where we will give God the glory he deserves. You're going to see your benefit, but it's not about you. When you see your benefit, you're going to turn around and go to the guy who gives you the faith, that gives you the hope, and you're going to go, you know what, just because of faith and hope, I got to give it up. That's showing God the reverence he deserves when you give him the glory he deserves. Does he deserve a little bit of your glory? No. He deserves the whole stinking plate of Thanksgiving glory. We just had Thanksgiving last week, right? And we're told that we got to fill up our entire plate with our thankfulness and our glory that we want to hold on to so much. But Ben, I did this. I did that. Yeah, stop being selfish. It's not about you. Turn and give it up. 2 Corinthians 4.16, I love this verse. This should be like my family scripture. And it says this, 2 Corinthians 4.16, That is why we never give up. Oh, it's not done. Oh, 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 that's not done. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. If your spirit's renewed, your body could die, and who cares? If you're dying right now, let's face it. Everybody raise their hand and say, we're one day closer to death than yesterday, right? Right, yeah, it's true. On this earth. My body is becoming weaker every day. I don't care what anyone says. You know, I've I've been cursed. Thank you, Adam and Eve. I've been cursed with death from this planet. I was not designed that way. But thank you, Adam and Eve. Thank you. But I have hope. Because my spirit's being renewed as my body dies away. So I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's not the next scripture. That's just true. And because my spirit's being renewed, I don't care if my joints hurt when God calls me to go. I don't care if my voice is gone when God calls me to preach. Because sometimes I I really need to preach like this. And say God loves me. And he wants to be. And there's this hope and it's an everlasting hope and it brings, it'll feed your faith. And and if you only had faith, you could see what true hope was like. So true, isn't it? If you only had faith, people go, I hope so all the time. Anybody say, I hope so in the past year? Yeah, everybody. Right, It's, it's something we do. I hope so. We long to hope. But if we don't have authentic faith in Jesus Christ, we have nothing really to hope for. Right? And so I don't give up on my friends who go, I hope so, but don't have a relationship because they have no faith. I don't give up. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 4.16 says, in the first sentence of that verse, it says, that is why I never give up. Give up is not allowed in my house. Lola says it sometimes. I don't ever say it. I, I do. I do. Everybody laugh. I do say it. And then God reminds me, Ben, you don't allow anyone else to say that. Why can you say that? Never give up. This is a phrase we share when we have hope. Don't you ever give up. Hope. It's, it's, it's life bringing to you. Who likes life? No one's raising their hand. Right? Who likes life? Really? I mean, who likes life? Everyone likes to live. You like to know that you're waking up tomorrow. Woo! I'm alive and free. Right? We like the idea of of being alive and free. And then we get out of bed and things change. Why am I not feeling as alive and free as when I was when I was in bed? Why, why am I not feeling alive and free? You know, on this topic, I'm off my notes. I'm really talking about depression. You get out of bed and it's depression. You wake up in the morning and you think, instead of I'm alive and free, sometimes you're dreaming 
life and freedom, and you wake up and the enemy attacks with thoughts. Don't give him credit. Go, I got this. Satan, you can't bring me down today. I got this. Why? Because I have faith in the Son of God who gave his life for me. Because he loved me. Now that's Galatians 2.20. If you don't believe me, look it up. But the reality of hope is it's not always easy. But don't give up. Don't, don't despair. I just heard Earl say that. Don't despair. Don't give up. Don't despair. You've got this. Earl, you've got this. It doesn't matter. You've got this. He shared something with me earlier. He's got that situation. Anybody else who you, you're thinking about a situation in your life and you're just like, I just don't know how. You're so desperate, but you forgot who to look to. Don't worry. He's got this. And because he's got this and because you've realized he's got this, you've got this. Don't give up. Don't give up means I'll move on. I'll go forward. Don't give up brings hope. And hope brings life. The opposite of don't give up is giving up. Someone say, aha, thank you, Captain Obvious. But also, with giving up, you lose the confidence of that helmet. That helmet of salvation. Giving up, you've lost that helmet in that battle. You've become exposed. Giving up, just give up. Just, why do you continue? Just give up. It's like blows against the head. It's, it's this thing, and it makes it harder. And we, we are surrounded by give up in our society. We have to be stronger than our society. We have to be stronger than our culture. We've got to be stronger than our government because the government wants us to give up. The people around us, not everyone, I'm, I'm generalizing. Don't, don't take me out of context. I'm generalizing. There are people in this world that want us to give up so quick. And there are, there are things in the unseen world that want us to give up right now. But you're going through something right now, and God's saying, you don't get a choice. You are not allowed to give up because you chose salvation and you put that helmet on that one fateful day. You can't take it off. It's not something I'm giving back. It's not something that I'm allowing to be blown off your head. You decide. But I'm not. And God says, God says, put it on and keep it on. Anybody ever say that to your kids? In cold months. Put it on and keep it on. I love it when I get to refer to myself as a child of God because he's saying, Ben, keep it on and put it on and keep it on. Keep it on, Ben. You already put it on. Keep it on. Get up this morning. Put it on. Keep it on. Then I have the shield of faith and he says, wear it and don't take it off. Right? And then all of a sudden I have this hope that's being fed and I'm like, wow. I can win. No? When I go on a ride, I know that if I have enough hope to go the extra mile on my bicycle, I can go the next 20 miles. I just have to have enough hope to make my legs so numb I can't feel them so that I can continue on forever. I rode across to Iowa. One day I did 88 miles. That's the longest ride of my life, and I did not want to complete it. But I had to hit that wall and ride through that wall to make my legs so numb that they would only go on one mission, and that was I got to finish. There was hope in the pain. That spoke to somebody. I know it did. There's hope in the pain of this life. There's hope in the miss opportunities of this life. There's hope in the wrong. Jesus says he'll make every bad situation good. Wow. There's hope found in Scripture. We just have to apply it. 
There's hope found in Scripture. We just have to apply it. When, when I go on these rides, sometimes it doesn't take one mile. Sometimes I'm so fit that it does take 20 miles to get to that point where I have to pray, Lord, make my legs numb. And at that point, I, I have to keep on hoping because it might take the next 10 miles to get out of that pain. I can't just stop. It's been one mile, my legs still hurt. It's been two miles, my legs still hurt. It's been three miles, my legs still hurt. So give up, give up, give up, give up. And the Lord says, don't you give up. Don't you dare have hope. When you go to worship, have hope. If our spirits are renewed, our attitudes will reflect that of our spirit. If you ask for renewal of your spirit, your spirit, your attitude, your outward attitude will re reflect that renewal of your spirit so others will have hope because your spirit has been renewed with hope. And all of a sudden, if you have hope, you can reproduce hope. Wait, 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 let me say that again. If you have hope, you can reproduce hope in others, in, in your family, in your children, in your friends, in the strangers that you walk by. You can reproduce hope if you only speak it, if you only share it. If you only walk by with an attitude of hope, you will share hope. And when hope has Christ at the start and end of it in your life, guess what you're reproducing? Anyone. Salvation. Because hope, faith, hope, leads to salvation in Christ. God, there's a hope. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. I don't have to just die and rot in the ground. I don't have to just be burned into ashes and forever forgotten. Because if anyone remembers me at the end of my life here on earth, if it's just God and he remembers me, I've made it. Hope. It's, the, it's in the worst possible situations that you find the hope that you didn't ever want. Man, life is terrible right now. And I just, oh, oh it's me. And Where'd this come from? I don't want this. Life is really good. No. Things are going really good. No, they're not. It's like this internal fight. If you have hope, then the bad things don't really look so bad. Because you're not looking at them, you're looking past them. I love this. I want to reproduce hope in others. Because I want to have the stamina and the strength of what hope brings forward so I do not even have to think it's just one more mile. I want to have, I think I have to repeat, I'm sorry for repeating so much, but I want to have the stamina and strength of what hope brings. If I have hope, I have more stamina, I have more strength. If I have more faith, I have more hope. And if I have more hope, I have more stamina and strength. I can continue fighting the fight. I can continue running the race. You're in a bad situation right now. Look to hope. Look to hope. Look to hope. Because he wants to bring hope on you so you can go forward and not look back. Don't look back. Go forward, Ben. Go forward. Move on. Have more strength. More stamina. Tomorrow you wake up because you hope today you will have hope for tomorrow. Woo! Come on. You want to revere God because God's the one who brings the hope that brings the strength and stamina for the rest of your life. He's so good. I want to Paul revere this thing to the ends of the world. The red coats are coming. No, Jesus is coming and he's coming to save you and set you free. He's coming to take what your, your bad things in life and make them good. He's coming to take your sin and throw it out. What? Hope. Hope can drive that attitude and that philosophy of life, that philosophy found in Christ. Hope. Hope. Hope is what drove Paul Revere that fateful night to light the lantern in the church building to announce the British are coming. Be ready. Hey, 
Here's something. The end of time is coming. Are you ready? Let me write that into it. There it is. Hope. Hope is lit. Hope is lit. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says this, For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory. Your troubles produce glory. Whoa. Whoa, no. No. No, Bible, you're wrong. You're, yet you're, they produce for us. A glory that vastly, oh, I wasn't even done. There's more, vastly outweighs them and will last for a minute. Oh, my bad. I mix that up with something that I, I generally fight most days called sin. Sin brings glory, did you know that? That lasts a minute. But your troubles, if you persevere with them, Oh, what are we talking about today? Hope. Persevere because of hope. We have these glories that last forever. And they will outweigh any trouble, big or small, ever again in your life. A small, little, teeny, weeny trouble. You stubbed your toe, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up for God because he wants to bring a glory that will outweigh any trouble in your life. And all you did was stub your toe. Anybody stub their toe this week? Well, if you did, I'm speaking to you. Um, <laughs> verse 18, so we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that can't be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we can't see will last forever. Don't look at right now. Look at forever. I love, love, love the writings of Abraham Lincoln. You know why? Because whenever he wrote a letter to someone referring to the government, he never wrote about himself or about his friend. He always wrote about my children's children's children. Why? Because you don't find hope for the now without looking to your children's children's children. I don't know about you, but 2019's coming and I'm already starting to dream. I want a place in Lake and Illinois that my son can come to church when he's 45. And I don't want it to be anywhere else but here. And if he's 45, more likely he'll have some kids. I hope he doesn't have grandkids at that time. But it's a new day and age. I will love him no matter what. Here's the reality. I want him when he's 65 to have a place he can call freedom a place where he can come and lift his hands and worship and give to God because of the hope that was presented before him. I want hope to come back to our church in a major way that says, uh-uh, I'm not going to complain, I'm not going to dispute, I'm not going to do anything that causes hope to die. I love, it. I love what hope does. Hope is one of those things, man. Hope is one of those things that that you can give anybody at any given time for any situation. You might not have the words, but the Holy Spirit will. David told me this week, I miss mama. That's sad. I had thought things that went through my mind. What if he said this and Lola wasn't with us? There are kids in that situation. So I, I looked at David and I said, we had talks this week, last week actually, about death. He goes, because his, his grandpa's dying, right? So got to have a talk with him. I don't care if he's four. I want to be real with him. And he goes, well, are you going to die? And I said, yeah. But I'm going to live in heaven. You're not going to see me here, but I'm going to live in heaven. Everyone dies, buddy. Everyone dies. But I have hope. And he's already accepted Jesus into his life. I have huge hope for him. But what about his friends? But he said this to me this week as, as we're here, as I'm batching it, and, and he's my only child for a week. 
Taco Tuesday. He said, I miss, I miss mama. And I told him, instead of thinking about how much you miss mama, think about how much fun you're going to have this week. I started listing things we were planning on doing. I planned on going sledding with him. Unfortunately, the hill was icy, and I'm not going to take my son down an icy hill. Not for his first time sledding. That's not much fun. I mean, it's fun when you're 12 and 34, but it's not so much fun when you're four and it's your first time going. And so I hope that I brought hope to him for the future. But what happened was he hasn't said I miss mama as much as other trips because he's thinking about the fun he's having right now so that he can miss mama when she gets home and love her. Because when you all of a sudden realize you missed mama all week and she's back, there's so much more love to give, right? And so speaking hope can be in such small situations as your son's missing you. Just speak hope. Not she'll be back in a week. Well, what, what are your plans? What's going on? Oh, wow, that'll be a lot of fun. Oh, I'm sorry that I'll miss that. It's a better perspective than what's missing today. Hope brings on this thought of what's ahead, not what's behind, not what's missing. Hope brings this thing that that it's a new perspective. It, It brings us life. Life is much more hopeful when we see the reason the Lord lets us go through the situations knowing that there's more. We're going through a situation more. There's a situation going on. There's more. I don't know what it is, but I know there's a reason. I know there's a purpose. I know that God has gotten a hold of me so well, and I've built this relationship so much for him that when I think of the situation, I see that he wants to bring glory out of for my benefit, and in turn for his. Life is much more hopeful when we see the reason the Lord lets us go through our situation. Here's the thing. We want to know specifics, don't we? I want to know specifics so I can have hope. Tell me how I'm going to be free from this situation, God. It doesn't always work that way. But he says, have faith that will produce hope so that you can make it. And then you can rest in my glory that was produced by it. Anybody want some rest this morning from your situations in life? I know I know, I do. I mean, my car is going to be worked on on the 11th finally. Right? Mark's sitting back there going, yeah, I have my car back. Well, not on the 11th, Mark. I, I might need it still. Thank you, by the way. But situations come, and if I put on a frown, and if I complain, if I, blah, 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 I can't do this, I can't do that, no, 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 no. You know what? Why did God give me two legs then? You know? Why did God give me breath in my lungs then? Like, why did, come on! There's more! As we overcome our current situations, we will see the fruits that are produced through the attitude of hope. An attitude of hope will produce more fruit of the Spirit than you'll ever imagine. As long as it's consistent hope. We are called to hope more today than we did yesterday. And consistently. Why? Because God's got it. We have to continually look past our current troubles, constantly stop looking at your current downed position, and rather look towards the heavens for the hope that was presented to us by Christ. Stop going like this. This is hopeless, isn't it? I think of Eeyore. Eeyore. Anybody know who Eeyore is? If you, does anyone not know who Eeyore is? Eeyore. Well, I guess. Winnie the Pooh, right? Does anybody know anyone with an E or attitude? 
everybody can raise their hand and go, yeah, 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 I know a couple people like that. Do you want to be around them much? You want to kick them to the curb and get out of the way because I've got more hope than you've got and I want to put it in you, but I can't because you're so downed, I can't even be around you. Challenge time. And I want to hear challenge accepted after this. Hang out with them, produce hope in them, build life through them, and make them go from uh, to like e Elmo, you know, like, e right? Tickle me Elmo. Do something about it. Change their life. Bring them hope. They're, oh, nobody wants to hang out with me. Good. Hang out with them. Change that. And if they tell you no one wants to hang out with them anymore, look at them in dead in the eyes and say, what am I doing? What am I doing? Oh, life's thrown me lemons. Good! Make lemonade! <laughs> Hope comes in the form of lemonade. But sometimes God throws us lemons to produce the hope in our life. You don't like making lemonade? Okay, come up with something you like making. What's your favorite meal? Because he's throwing you the raw ingredients of that and he's saying, make it. Right? After I wrote that last statement, I put, but Ben, this has been going on for blah, 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 many years, and blah, 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 this, and blah, 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 that. Does anyone ever go deaf and mute when things, like complaints start coming, and you're like, okay, I'm going to sit here, but I'm turning these off. I don't even have hearing aids. Feel sorry for me. I can't turn them off. I'm just kidding. I can. It's called, it's called being male. Um, yeah, ask Lola. Um, but great. Great. I'm glad you're blah, blah, blahing right now because someone has to blah, blah, blah all over you. Right? Because once they get the blah, blah, blah out, you get to speak hope. You get to speak peace and love and, and gentleness and self-control. You get to speak life. There's a song. I'm not going to sing it. But there's a song about speaking life. You got to speak life. I'm like, when someone comes up to me, blah, blah, blah. Great. We have to look to Jesus, to the heavens, to adapt and overcome in our current situations with hope. I'm reminded of old stories of the Israelites going through the wilderness. Talking to Moses. Anybody? I mean, they start accusing. Yeah, who's pointing now? Remember, whenever you point, and I do this a lot during messages, but you point, what's the, what's the phrase? When you point, what, how many fingers are pointing back? Oh, yeah. Three fingers are pointing back out of the eight that you have because these are two thumbs. Right? So you got three fingers pointing back at yourself, and, and whenever you point, even with your words, how many times is God pointing back at you with his hands open wide? There's hope. See, Paul writes here that, that we should choose hope at all times. Do you see that? Do you see that? In that last scripture, we can pull it back up. In, first, in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18, he states that we need to have hope. Learn from your mistakes of old. Learn from the mistakes of your brothers and sisters. That's what I tried to do. And then after I moved out, I said, oh, uh, I didn't learn those. <laughs> My turn. Learn from the mistakes. Move forward. Do we see that when we do not have hope, that we have decided our present position on our situation is more important than the situation that God has us set for? That was a lot. Do we see that when we are so focused on our downed situation, our downed perspective, when we're so weighed down by our own wanting to be in this position that we reject the position that God has called for us for the future and for right now? When we are so like right here, oh, it's so heavy, but we're not willing to go to our knees and be like, but Lord, you're so good. This is a more lightweight position than this one. Trust me, I played basketball and you had to do those wall stance like that. 
and just stand there. And I'm not good at it anymore because it's been years. But there's more weight when you're down like this and burdened, heavy burdened, with everyone else's issues and your own, than when you're saying, God, I give it up. That didn't hurt. I promise. <laughs> I promise. It hurt the ground more than it hurt me. But God, I think you're so good. This is a better position to be in when you're weighed down than anything. I've been going on forever, and I promise I'm almost done. This is a good, a good s- series, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm excited about it because of the revelation God's brought to me. That when we hope, we build life. When we have joy and we have the attitude of joy, we produce life. And when we, we have an attitude of, of the other topics in this series that I can't remember right now, we produce life. Hope, joy, peace. Peace is the other one. Hope, joy, peace. When you have those, this is my first Advent series, so forgive me. When you have those characteristics, you're announcing the king is coming. And by announcing the king is coming, you're filling someone else's tank with life. And you're filling it up. And you're filling it up. And you're not, you're not condemning them. You're not calling out their wrongdoings. But you're trying to get them to enjoy love. Enjoy joy. Enjoy peace and hope. And you're trying to get them to realize and turn around and look at Jesus square in the face and go, I've been missing you my whole life. But now I have you. And I want you. Advent means to announce something is coming. To announce something is coming. Paul's letting us letting us know that Jesus is coming back. That's why I chose to go through Paul for the first four sermons. We'll end it with Christmas Eve, and that's the story of Christ's birth, because that is the hope that we are learning about today. Maybe you're in a season today, and you're just done. You're ready to give up. The season's not making any more sense. It's hard for you to see past it. I believe the Lord wants to tell you today during worship that you need his hope. You might have lost a job. You might have had a doctor's visit and gotten a bad a bad uh, thing. There you go, report. Maybe you've been too bad this week and you're thinking, I've been just too bad. I can't. God doesn't love me. Maybe you've participated in too many junky things, and that's okay. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna point the finger. I have my own sins to take care of, you know. But what I want to say right now is that Jesus is telling you in those situations, in those bad decisions, in those bad times, in those bad moments, in the bad situations of your life, He still loves you. He still accepts you into his family. He still wants to adopt you every day into his family and love you as his own. He still cares about you and he still wants to bring you more hope. More hope. More hope. More hope. He wants to remind you that in your hopelessness you're being selfish. But when you're hopeful there's more. 